welcome to Design Notes. I'm Liam Spradlin, and this time I got the chance to talk to interaction designer and author Dan Saffer. In the episode, we dive deep into the theoretical UX questions and principles discussed in Dan's work. From what might make us uncomfortable about cooking a roast from across the planet, to the myth of invisible design, and how we can get a handle on the hidden well of functionality offered by voice interaction. Let's get started. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Design Notes. It's good to get you on. Great to be here. Uh, so just to start off, like I always do, um, what kind of things have you worked on? And uh, I guess, what are your passions or what are you excited about in your work? Man, what what haven't I worked on? Uh, I've, I've done everything from pure kind of marketing websites all the way through, well, robots. And before that, wearables and ovens and mobile apps and web apps and <laughs> vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and small home electronics and just lots and lots of things. And that's kind of what has been great about my career and, and our profession is you do get to work on a lot of different things in a lot of different industries. Um, and that's been a real, a real joy for me to be able to do those, just the wide variety of things I've been able to to get my hands on over my career. I mean, when I started, there was there was kind of graphic designers, there were industrial designers, and then there were you know web designers, which is kind of the bucket that I fell into. And slowly over time, have expanded into mobile apps and and physical hardware, which has been a really interesting progression throughout my career uh doing you know things like doing some of the first touch screens that were for commercial uh and consumer use and then you know doing a lot of you know over the last couple years a lot of internet of things type objects cool so an absolutely huge range then yeah (laughs) yeah yeah you could say that i i I often forget what i've worked on i've been like oh yeah that's a that's something that wait, I, I did something like this before. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I, re- I remember that project. So <laughs> That's awesome. Definitely something a lot of designers aspire to, I think. Um, so uh, I want to talk about, you've written an immense body of work too. Um, I think four books just on your site, along with some really compelling uh, just online posts. Um but I want to talk specifically about gestural interactions. Um, so you wrote a book called Designing Gestural Interfaces. And in the preface, I read that even while you were writing the book, multiple factors changed that kind of inform that informed parts of the book. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, what what do gestural interfaces encompass? Like if you had to define what a gestural interface is, what would you call that? what is it gestural interfaces for me anyway were an attempt to wrap my arms around anything that was not an input an input device that wasn't using a peripheral so something that wasn't a keyboard something that wasn't a mouse something that wasn't a joystick what are the what are the things that were using your your hands or body to trigger it that that wasn't voice because i knew that that was a whole other other set of things but for me it was so it was either things like touch screens things that you tap or things that you press and hold or swipe or do all the things that we do on our phones now or they were kind of what i was calling freeform gestures where they were gestures in space and you could wave your arm and turn the lights on or you could you know pat you could you know do do a, a movement like you know when you're playing Wii or something like that and it and it makes a or the Microsoft Connect and it and it has an effect either either in the physical space like a really crude old example is you step on a mat in front of your local grocery store and the door opens uh, that was like one of the first kind of freeform gestural interfaces to now you can have a whole bunch of things set up where you can do a gesture and it creates a whole 
you know, setting, hey, it tells your house, hey, I'm home and, you know, turn on the thermostat, turn on the lights, turn on the television, you know, it, it can have all these different controls. So the gestural interfaces book was kind of a, a way to start to think about think about how we could use our bodies in ways that were more than just typing and using a using a mouse to interact with the digital world, which is fast becoming the physical world. And uh, yeah, as I was writing it, it was um, back in the kind of early days of a consumer facing touchscreens, consumer facing touchscreens, things like uh, things like kiosks. And the, the, I mean, the iPhone was brand new as I was writing it. The iPad hadn't even come out yet. So there was stuff that was changing as I was writing it. And I, I kind of knew like, oh, man, this this book is like, uh, you know, a little bit before its time, you know, it would, you know, and, and there were other books that were coming out at the same time that I, you know, I felt like had a longer longer life and you know just because you know they were they would come out a couple months after and, and be like oh yeah that's that's how it is because you had a couple extra months with with the iphone or something like that to be able to 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 play with it so uh so yeah so it was a book that was um it, it was trying to capture a moment and what was interesting about i mean and obviously the touchscreen stuff is has really taken off and is now everywhere, uh, even in places where it shouldn't be. Uh, but the gestural stuff is kind of frozen in time. There's not, I, I mean, it's, it, there's a very limit, there's still a pretty limited application for it. I, I think people just haven't figured out what exactly to do with it yet. So I think that that's, that's still something that's on the horizon, like where where that's going to end up going. Right. And um, I was going to bring up 3D Touch specifically um, in just a second, but having gotten that definition of what a gestural interface is, um, I want to ask, do you think with something like 3D Touch, where it's essentially simulating a button, like does that still count as gestural at that point because there's not an actual button? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, that's an interesting question because it, it kind of rides that line of is it physical? Is it digital? Is it is it a movement in space? Yeah, I mean, Apple has definitely been trying to kind of uh, push push that a little bit more where you're able to feel, you know, different levels of things. And I've even seen uh, some new kind of 3D keyboard style things where you're able to access different things at different heights and stuff like that and, and all that stuff is really interesting uh i i don't know what i i suppose i would call the you know it is definitely a type of gestural interface but yeah the the line the line is definitely fuzzy because it it does rely on a it I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, w- I would say, yeah. So continuing along the lines of 3D touch, I think that, like you said, gestures still being kind of on the horizon of like user discovery and, and finding contexts where these things belong. Uh, once we move past like basic tapping gestures, even to like long press or swiping something from off screen or things like that, uh, there are a lot of criticisms that, these kinds of gestures like on a smartphone for instance are hard to discover or sometimes they can be hard to predict Um, like if you for instance one example i can think of is the leap motion controller um, when that first came out and uh at the time i was working in a company that did uh, like experience marketing so we did a lot of interactive stuff and we explored using leap for uh, like exhibits and things but it turned out that users uh like the learning curve of manipulating something with your hands in 3D space without feedback was too difficult to like engage them in the experience. So I guess basically what I'm saying is that I think we think of gestures as still having a lot of problems, um, but at the same time, I believe that a lot of gestures can be appropriate in the right context. So what would you say about uh, 
how we can tell whether a given gesture is appropriate in a given situation, and also whether there's any way to like ease these problems of discovery. Yeah, you've got this real problem of visibility and learnability when it comes to gestural interfaces, where A is just knowing, just knowing that something is there. You know, oh, I can turn these. I can turn these lights on, you know, with by waving at my, you know, or, you know, I, I often give the example of that everyone has had where you're in a bathroom stall and the lights go out <laughs> and you're like, oh, God, this is a, there's just so you're like frantically waving, trying to find where the sensor is on the ceiling, you know, like, hey, no, there's still motion here. Um, so, yeah, there's there's that whole problem of. You know, is there something there? And you have this, you know, when you get to certain multi-touch gestures on on the phone of, you know, being, you know, oh, I didn't know that a, you know, long press did this, or I didn't know that a swipe to the left did this. So there's this whole learnability problem that happens, and how do you how do you go about? solving that and and people have tried over the years all all different manner of of ways to do that for a while i remember in mobile the first thing that would pop up would be like the screen that's like you know with arrows everywhere like tap here for this tap (laughs) here for that and i think luckily that that kind of went away um but the problem still didn't and so i mean my my general rule for that has always been you know keep Keep things that everyone's going to do out and visible and, and easily tappable. But start to you can also start to figure out ways to add these kind of invisible invisible gestures for power users. So people that may discover them in the process of doing something. So uh, Tumblr has a really good thing of this on their uh, on their app where in the corner there's a button for for creating a um, for creating a new Tumblr post. And so if you tap it, you, then you can select the kind of Tumblr post it is, whether it's a picture or whatever. But if you press and hold on it, it, it will give you two options where you can do text or you can do an image, which are the two most common Tumblr posts. So you can kind of do this fast kind of radial, radial menu gesture that, that comes up. And that's really nice for people who are... Uh, for for people for who the, you know their their power users, so doing those kinds of things I think is where um, is where the multi touch kind of magic can come in, and I think that yeah, keeping everything else that that most people are going to use most of the time available and and visible and those kinds of things is 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 I think important. Um, but yeah, this is a this is an own and and this is certainly a, a problem when you start to talk about you know gestures in space. How do you know? How do you know which gesture does what? You can see this in uh, again in bathrooms where people were you know sometimes will wave at the sink to try to get the water to flow and it, you know and it doesn't work like that. <laughs> I've waved at the sink at times where there's actual knobs to actually turn the, the you know there's faucets to turn the thing on um but uh yeah so it's it's and then voice is 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 the is the next one where it's like well how do i how do i know how deep my you know google home or my alexa goes i don't know how you know what right. what's what what's the depth of that that's the and it's hard to tell i mean my my echo came with a little card that's like here try some of these things out and they send me an email every week like what's new here's here's some new stuff that's happening but um but it's not visible it's not there like and there's no there's no visible menu that i can call up there's nothing that i mean you could say like alexa tell me some things that you do and it'll suggest some stuff but yeah it's it, it it's a learnability problem. And I think that's kind of risky too, right? Like having this kind of depth of function that isn't expo like isn't explicitly stated to the user. Uh, for instance, you know, there's long press, which I honestly discovered a feature in Instagram like just 
a couple weeks ago that I had never ever noticed before, which is if you if you long press the search tab in the bottom bar, it focuses the search field right away, which is great. Uh, but for something like 3D Touch or for a voice controlled thing, uh, it's I feel like it's risky because when it works, it's super rewarding, and that makes the user want to try it all over the place. But then when it doesn't work, it's uh, damaging, I guess. Like, it's not a fun experience. So, for instance, if you 3D touch an icon and it has, like, an awesome widget, uh, then that's great. But if you 3D touch and try to 3D touch another one, then maybe nothing happens. And you nothing feel happens, like, yeah. yeah. No, that's a super frustrating situation yeah like when when the system when the system is inconsistent like that you're like well you know does it reward my does it reward my experimentation or does it just frustrate me right so um i wonder if there's kind of a learning curve with things like these like we have elements like this in systems today uh do you think that given enough time users would come to expect them to work or I wonder, like, what factors would go into that? Yeah, it, well, it's funny because back in the earlier days of of computing history, you had people that, uh, when you were programming or even using using programs like you know WordPerfect or something, you had, and especially if you ever dropped down into into DOS or Unix or any of these things, you had a set of commands that you had to kind of know and memorize. You just had to know that you just had to know how, you know, how, how basically how it worked. And the GUI came and replaced a lot of that. But now we're kind of on the other side of that, where again, it's like, oh, we had to remember a whole bunch of commands and, and, you know, and, and how, and how stuff works kind of keep that um, in the back of our minds. And um, it's, it's funny that we, you know, because and and I'm I'm sure that you know there's going to be something that's probably going to make it swing back up into much more discoverable again. You know, these these things tend to be cyclical, but until then, yeah, I think that there's, I mean, I, I would imagine, especially for some of these voice and gesture systems, that there's a small set of there's a small set of of commands that people do all the time so in my house you know for alexa we use the timer we use music we use uh the weather report so it's just a, it's a small number of things out of potentially dozens and dozens that that we could be using um but don't know about but maybe once we've discovered one it's like oh wow that's really interesting because there are times that we occasionally play with well, can you do this now? Um, especially over time, it's like, oh, wow, Alexa can now do this or Google Home can now do this. And uh, and that's kind of interesting. But we've also, getting back to our, what we were just talking about, we've also had the like, oh, let's try this and had it be like, wah, wah, you know, that, that didn't work. And so you're like, <laughs> oh, well you know this thing is dumb or you know like you know it's it just doesn't work the way we thought it would it's just not as smart as we thought it would so i mean the ex the expectations of these invisible systems are, are are strange you know because it's like sometimes you think that wow they're they're really smart and other times it's like wow they're really dumb and um uh, and it's some it's sometimes pretty hard to tell you know, are, are you smart today or are you dumb today? It's like, you know, and, and so, right. you know, if you do your tried and true stuff, you know, you're, you're going to be fine. But anytime that you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to really test this thing out. Sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. And speaking of that, um, you wrote a really great piece uh, on the myth of invisible design, which uh, candidly, I feel like the idea that good design is invisible is like so ingrained into the dialogue around design that the idea that it's a myth and saying it's a myth feels very like dangerous and fun. And I, I want to talk more about that. Um, so in the piece, uh, you talk a lot about 
uh, dividing design into the qualities of being ready at hand and present at hand. So just for listeners who aren't familiar, um, what do those two things mean and how do they compare? Yeah, so this is an old uh, uh, an old Heidegger uh, bit where and the the very the the classic example is is a hammer. So and with a hammer, uh, you're when you're using it to bang in a nail, you're not paying any attention to it. It is it's a tool. It's an extension of your hand. You're not thinking about it, and so that's. Uh, ready at hand or readiness at hand. It, the, the, the translations go a, a couple different ways. So ready at hand is that. But if the hammer, like if the head of the hammer starts to fall off or um, or the grip doesn't feel good, then you become aware of the hammer. And that means that it's uh, that it's present at hand. You, you, re- you recognize the hammer for when it's for, for a thing. And it interrupts your flow, so it's kind of this bouncing back and forth to um, between the two, um, and when you want to be when you want to be aware of the tool versus when you don't want to be aware. So, I mean, I don't want to, you know, when I'm typing, I don't want to be thinking about the keyboard. I just want to be I want to be using it to make words. But if I'm, you know, if, if I'm thinking about, you know, what, what is the, you know, which, if I hold, you know, sh- what, what do I use to make an N, an N dash or something like that, like what the command is, then I have to think about, oh, what is the keyboard command for this? What, what is the, what's the number that I press to, to bring that up? So I have to kind of switch back and forth. Now, the people that say, oh, you know, the design should all be invisible my the thing that I counter with is like well you know okay so if 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 my keyboard let's imagine my keyboard was invisible and I was just able to you know somehow somehow type or I guess you know through voice how would I know like that I could do things like an an m dash or something like that you know what is the where where does that go and I think that I, I keep hearing the, you know, designs invisible, designs invisible, designs invisible. And then I look around my house and I see a million objects that are visible and they're beautiful and they're made to be seen <laughs> and made to be used. And um, and I'm like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, I, I, under, I understand the idea of not one. I, under, I understand the idea of, of you know being ready at hand where you're you're not paying attention to the tool but there is this idea like you know if and and there is this idea that if you are fumbling with the tool too much you can't find you know you can't find the command you can't find what to do then yeah it is it is the design is too can be too present uh and so you and so yeah that might be an example of a bad design but if the if the actual object that you have actually makes the activity that you're doing even better than it would have been without it so like a really beautiful keyboard that really works well or a really beautiful screen that helps you uh, design or a really comfortable chair like the things that the the designs that help that that are uh, that can be more present, more visible, can sometimes increase and ex- and expand and make the make the design and make the activity better. And for me, that's that's an example of good design when something is when something is is so well designed that it makes the activity more pleasurable to do. And that was kind of what I was getting at at that article. So in the piece, you point out that uh, something like going back to the Amazon Echo, um, that the product actually isn't very ready at hand because there are so few indicators that kind of tell the user explicitly what the device can do. Uh, So, you know, ostensibly the goal for these devices is that one day we would be able to talk to them just like we would a person and they would respond to us with all the information they know. but we know that in practice they aren't there yet. So 
I guess uh, if you had to predict the future, do you expect that these devices will get to that level of, of natural interaction? And in the meantime, is there anything that we can do to kind of relieve some of that stress? Like, will we just have to rely on users uh, exploring and potentially being disappointed with the results? Or is there something else we can do to kind of ease that discovery problem? I believe that we, I believe we will eventually get there. I think that it's probably, you know, 10 to 15 years away. Uh, some of these objects will probably be, it'll be a little, it'll be trickier for them just because it's, it's pretty hard to know context and pretty hard to know um, you know the the human the human world in a way that we refer to pretty casually at, at all different times so if we can say like oh what's what's the book on the shelf next to the blue book or or what's or yeah or what's what's that book over there next to the blue one that's actually a pretty hard sentence to figure out, you know, or or things that are that are that are threaded like, oh, can you uh, can you check the refrigerator and, and see if there's enough milk for a cup of coffee? You know, that just requires a real level of, you know, what is what is refrigerator? What is you know, what is milk? How much how much coffee? You know, how much milk is in a cup of coffee? You know, those those kinds of things. It's it's. There's just so much nuance to them that that it's going to be difficult. I don't think it's impossible, but it's just a lot of data that needs to flow into these things. I mean, luckily, there's now millions of people providing tons of data f to these things, you know, basically for free. Uh, so I, I think that that will eventually get there. And but the. The interesting thing is going to be how is that is is that you know ready at hand problem? How can we how can we have it so that it's not a constant, um, not a constant trying to figure out uh, you know how to use it, what it's good for, and the depth it can go. I think um, I mean one of the there is a there is a privacy issue involved in that having these things listen to you all the time is not particularly something that you, most people would want so having it just you know if you're talking to your spouse and you're like oh you know i wonder if i wonder if you know my daughter is home from school yet and the device just chimed in like why, yeah, she's 10 minutes away. Something like that would be like, whoa, that's that that's crossing a line. That that's pretty creepy. Um, but if you say, you know, Alexa, you know, how is is my daughter nearby? And it could say, yeah, so she's on the bus or something like that. Um, that's that would be something interesting because there is, you know, because I've I've asked that without it volunteering information for me now. It could be that in the next 10 to 20 years, that level of privacy completely shifts. I mean, I remember the, the fights 10 years ago about people saying like, well, why would you ever put pictures of yourself and tell, you know, stuff online, you know, the you know, social networks, why would you ever use that or tell people what you're having for lunch or take, you know, so the privacy, even from 10 years ago has completely shifted what it will be like. You know in 20 years i don't uh, i don't know i mean it could be that yeah we're fine you know particularly for people that are living alone or something like that maybe they want that kind of um back and forth with you know with an alexa or with a robot or uh those kinds of things where um, it, the autonomy level for these things goes up a lot higher and that that would be a really interesting really interesting space but uh, I mean, until then, I mean, I try to think of some of the uh, some of the things you could do to increase uh, visibility into into knowing what um, uh, into knowing what these things can do and when. 
there could be things like um, there could be prompts that happen at at interesting times. Like if there's, you know, if there's silence in the room and um, usually at this time of day, I often ask Alexa, hey, what, uh, you know, what's the weather going to be like? And I haven't asked yet this today and it knows I'm in the room and and I haven't asked yet, it could say like, you know, Dan, would you like me to tell you the weather today? You know, there's, there's, there's these, there's a, there's a middle ground between, you know, interruptions and, um, uh, and a full autonomy and like learning patterns of behavior that I think could be, could be the middle ground that we could start to see that, that, that could be a really interesting place to play in. But again, really hard because, you know, the context, you know, might, you know, I might be deeply engrossed in a novel or something like that and don't want the interruption of that. So it's 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 such a hard it's such a hard thing. But there could be things like, uh, you know, the I mean, the next round of, you know, things like AR, you could you could have some idea, you know, as if you had your phone out or something like that, it, it could show, Hey, here's a couple of things that you've, there's, there's a couple of live things in this room that here's some basics that you could do, um, to display that again. I'm, I, I think that that could be really interesting, particularly when, when you don't realize, Oh, wow, this, this lamp is, you know, this lamp is alive and can do different things that, that I had, had even expected, um, but I also I I'm I'm deeply an opponent of having to pull out my phone to to you know to use a small appliance that's right in front of me. Like I I really I, I I'm I'm not a fan of that. Uh, you know it, it drives me crazy when it's like oh well, we we've removed all the all the buttons and and everything else off of your you know, off your dishwasher and now you had to pull your phone out to do it. And I'm like, ah, don't make me do that. I just, you know, I, I just want to, I just want to control it. Give me a button to turn it on and go rather than it, everything being on my phone. Yeah. And I think, uh, like on the topic of these voice or home devices, um, two things, uh, stood out as you were talking. One of them is that uh, I think that the ability to sense presence will be a big deal, like knowing when someone's in the room and also reference. So knowing when you're talking to it. Uh, and I also wonder, like, if you are asking advice, uh, you know, check the refrigerator and see if there's enough milk for a cup of coffee. Um, is that not something like are those types of commands not something that that might be more easily accomplished using a graphical interface i guess what i mean is that if we are talking to devices at least until the point where we're having like regular conversations with them uh are we not kind of then being forced to assess the the thing that we want to accomplish and then describe that in like a specific code to the device. Yeah, I guess it. I guess it depends on a couple things. I mean, voice is voice is pretty fast if if the device can recognize what you're what you're you know what you're saying and 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 what you're referring to. I mean, the time that it would take to pull out pull out my phone open up an app look inside my thing is probably much much slower the, the look inside my refrigerator at you know turn on the you know is probably slower than than a computerized system could do it cuz I, I you know in an ideal world you could say blah 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 you know go is do i have enough milk left for a cup of coffee and then it could instantly come back you know if it knew all those things, could instantly come back and say yes. Um, it's it's that whole um, you, you know kind of chatbot 
you know, craze that's kind of happening now where, you know, you can text certain things that are just much faster than you could use a GUI to find them out. Like, oh, you know, do I have, you know, how much money do I have in my, in my bank account? Well, you know, for discrete pieces of information, sometimes, you know, text and chat and voice make a lot of sense because they're just super fast. I can, you know, I could text that to my bank and get a response back faster than I could open up my Wells Fargo app and log in and blah, blah, you know, do all these things. Um, so I think that there's this, yeah, there's this, there's this threshold that, that, that hits that, that you, you know, that, 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 that'll be interesting. Yeah. Cause, cause some things are going to be something. Uh, yeah. But until that happens, sure. I mean, there may be uh, until, you know, these devices are, you know, fully cognizant of, of context and, and parts of your house. Yeah. The, it may make more sense to open you know if you have to like explain everything well the, you know milk is you know milk is in the blue bottle in the refrigerator on the left shelf you know like um if you have to do a lot of that and then it's like i can't find what you're looking for i can't you know like um yes it will be a lot easier just to pull out your phone or just you know walk to the walk to the refrigerator and open the door and just be like ah, here you know so I mean, that's the other thing is like, you know, hey, if, if I'm out in the street and I need to know whether, you know, do I have enough milk for, you know, for breakfast tomorrow, that, you know, the, those are the kinds of things that, you know, the Samsungs and the LGs of the world have been trying to crack that nut for 20 years now so that you can be like, yes, I, you know, yes, I do have enough. And you know, or no, here, I'll add it to your, you know, to buy list or, you know, your Amazon fresh list and it'll be waiting for you when you get home. I mean, that's, that's been a big, that's been a big uh, IOT goal for, <laughs> for 20 years. So. So we will get to that point eventually at which it will absolutely be faster than, um, but going back to what you were saying about turning your dishwasher into an app. Um, you also wrote a post, uh, about complex about, well, about controls. Um, but it also talks about complexity and I learned from Don Norman that complexity is fine and maybe even desirable when it's exposed to the right person at the right time in the right context. Uh, but in the post, you go a bit deeper on that, uh, by bringing up Tesla's law of the conservation of complexity. And I recommend that listeners go check out this post. But uh, in the meantime, what is Tesla's law? Mm. Uh, Larry Tesla, uh, one of the uh, guys at Park, he created Cut and Paste as just one one, one of his many uh, contributions to the to the world of of human computer interaction. Uh, but uh, Larry has a really interesting idea. He's base he's basically said that all all processes have a core of complexity, even something as simple as, uh, you know, making a sandwich or sending an email. There's a there's a core of complexity. And when you try to automate that by you know putting it as part of a system, you had to figure out who handles that core of complexity. Is it the system or is it the user? So in the case of email, the original first email clients you had to always type in who you were sending it to, who it was from, and then subject to email matter, and and it would be sent off. And so basically the user had to handle a lot of the complexity of sending an email message. And over time, some of that has gotten more and more, um, more and more and more automated. So now like you can start to type a name and it'll fill that in. You don't ever have to type in your name. It knows who you are. You know, you can, you know, you could switch it, but, uh, but it auto it knows who you are. You, then you just, you know, type and send. So it's handling some of the complexity for you. Now you can imagine something that is, um, even, you know, uh, even less, you know, where all the complexity is handled by the system, 
So you take a, a, a silly app like the Yo app last year, where all it did was send the word Yo to a friend, you know, so so you didn't, there was no complexity in it. You just tapped and it sent Yo and they could send, you know, Yo back. But that was all it did. Uh, the Most of the complexity was handled by the system. Um, and so when you're thinking about these kinds, and, and so when you're thinking about, you know, designing things, so you have to kind of figure out like, okay, what is, if I'm pushing stuff more towards the user, it becomes a, a more complex system because they have, there's more choices that have to be made. There's may have to be more, more navigation, more menus, more controls, more buttons. And if you put it more on the system side of things, you may lose a lot of nuance. You might, uh, there may be less to, to do, but, but you, you may lose some like important, important pieces to the process. So you can think about something like photography, you know, uh, a, a photographer, a professional photographer is going to want a lot of control. So they, they want tons of, they want tons of complexity exposed and but someone who isn't a photographer, like a point and shoot camera is fine. Like, or, you know, your, your, your phone is, is now fine. The phone, the phone cameras are now great. I mean, they've taken a lot of the complexity and put it behind the scenes. I mean, you may have to choose, oh, is this a portrait or a photo, but they're doing, a, they're handling a lot of the complexity for you. And now a professional photographer probably isn't going to want all of that, isn't, isn't going to like that. They're going to want more complexity. So it's always this kind of balancing act. And you can, you can see it playing out across a number of different fronts. You know, things like um, enterprise apps, for instance, may expose a lot of complexity because there's a lot that, for instance, a customer service rep may have to do with someone's order that you wouldn't want to put for the customer themselves. Like the customer may not want to know what warehouses things are being routed from and, and wouldn't wouldn't need those kinds of controls. It's all kind of behind the scenes. The system is doing it. But for a customer service rep, they're going to want that complexity exposed. So Tesla's law is all about, you know, there is this complexity. How are you going to deal with it? And Don Norman's point, yeah, was always that it's it's not the compl complexity that's the problem. It's when it becomes overly complicated when you when you when things you know aren't aren't grouped together well, or or you or it's like there's too much complexity for what the task is, or you've tried to replicate every piece of the task without actually asking yourself like, wow, does someone really need does someone really need to see this or know this? Um, those kinds of things, I think, uh, is, is what Don was kind of talking about. But the the Tesla's law of complexity is a great one as you're thinking about the kind of interface that you're making and who it's for and what they're using it for. Right. So, and just kind of striking that balance, because I'm sure that we've all uh, dealt with an experience that's either too complex for us or hides too much from us and ends up not doing what we want in the process. Um, but besides the presence and the exposure of those controls, you also talk about uh, the importance and the impact of where the controls are. So assuming important controls are given to the user, obviously, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, uh, the thought of like controlling major appliances remotely, like the thought of controlling my food that's in an oven or on a range somewhere in a different room, or even if I'm out of the house and cooking something remotely, like that is kind of scary to me, right? Like there's kind of an emotional response there. Uh, but then on the other hand, the idea of controlling like laundry or dishes or things that I don't particularly like to do and they're like simple tasks, that seems pretty helpful. Um, have you found, I guess, like a trend line of where this kind of comfort or discomfort exists on remote controls? I think it has to do with the frequency and number of of uh, choices that you have to make and the speed at which you have to make them. So things like your laundry, well, there's the choices are right up front. 
you don't you put it in you 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 set the set the dials and go but with something like cooking you may have to monitor it and make choices like on a minute by minute sometimes you know second by second basis oh is this burning so i think that there is this level of uh discomfort the 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 more choices that you have to make and the more nuance there is to those choices so i think that for me that's kind of where that line gets drawn like you know how how much am i gonna have to how much do do i have to cognitively think and and trust you know that my uh that what's happening is actually happening now this again might be a thing where we grow more uh, we grow more comfortable with with our machines taking on more and more making more and more of those choices for us like okay it can tell you know my stove can tell when the meat needs to be flipped and and I don't have to tell it in the same way that now I don't think about like when I put my dishes in my dishwasher, I don't think about what's happening to them at any point because the result has been fine. You know, the result has been consistently fine. I only care about it when like, well, these dishes are coming out dirty again. Like, you know, is there some maintenance or something that I have to do for it that, you know, am I out of, you know, rinsing fluid or whatever? Um, and the same could be said for some of this autonomous stuff. And, and I think this is something that's happening not just in home stuff, but, you know, cars and, you know, everything else where things that we, you know, in a car, we have to make just an incredible. I forget. I, I read, you know, some incredible statistics where we're making like a decision a second or something like that, where it's, it's just a huge amount of decision processing that's happening. And um, and and getting our cars to kind of do this stuff uh, is is disconcerting. Much less, you know, what when your car is, I mean, and at least you're kind of there. You know, in a lot of the cars now, you'd actually be there to like, you know, take control if something happened. But if your car, let's say, was housed on the other side of the city, and you sum you to summon it, you know, how is it going to be? scary that it's coming here on its own and doing stuff i don't yeah i mean these are all you know theoretical questions that are becoming fast becoming practical and emotional questions for us and uh yeah i, th I think the line the line is going to shift over time about what we're comfortable controlling from afar versus being being attentive to um, and I think that'll both have its, it'll have its pluses and minuses. I mean, you can see, you know, the cooking's a real skill and like, and, you know, being there to like taste it and be like, oh, this needs a little bit more salt, you know, because the quality, you know, the meat's a little different this time or it's, the meat is, you know, isn't tender or, or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, the, all the little nuances that go into cooking that make it more of a of an art you know that 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 you could worry could get lost now again for people who who don't care about cooking or stuff like that and just want to be like hey i want to push this button or you know have my you know sous vide machine or my crock pot just turn on you know when it knows that i'm you know going to be home in a couple hours you know that stuff is that stuff is, is fast approaching. If if not here already, I know the the connected crock pot's already here. Another example that you brought up in the post uh, along those lines was uh, kind of related to obfuscating what the control is actually controlling. So controls uh, in these sorts of examples are kind of designed around goals rather than explicit mechanics. Uh, and you give the example of coming home and finding out that your DVR didn't actually record the show that you wanted to record and who do we blame. Uh, so I guess I'm interested in how, how that kind of blame for handling errors factors into giving the user appropriate feedback 
So letting them know what happened and what level of detail you need to go into, which I guess is another facet of complexity. Yeah, it's interesting because I literally had that exact same event happen to me where I was expecting a show to record and didn't record. And I was like, well, I was certain that I certain that I pushed the button because I use I use the TiVo app and the T and my TiVo didn't record it. And I was like, who, yeah, who do I blame? You know, is it me? Is it user error? Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, some of these things are going to have to have um, some kind of some kind of log about w- what's being triggered when and and how and by whom. And then they're also going to need a way to uh, delete this or not or or not show that Um, and let me let me explain because that was a lot to lot to unpack I mean we thought about this a lot um, with the robot where what if it's what if it sees something that it shouldn't see or what if it hears something that it doesn't hear I mean we talked a little bit about yeah once once objects in your house can detect presence, like, well, what if I'm not supposed to be home? What if I'm supposed to be at work or at school and I'm, I'm faking that I'm sick and I'm actually, you know, I'm actually at the museum or something like that. Or, you know, uh, I said I was at the doctor's office, but I'm actually at home. And so, uh, so there's that kind of stuff. Like, how do we, how do we get things to reveal what it, uh, what they've been commanded to do and 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 by whom so i know like um i know with the uh, amazon echo now you can kind of see who's issued you can see what the what commands were issued it doesn't it's not yet smart enough to to recognize oh that was my voice versus my wife's voice versus my daughter's voice so there's there's stuff like that there's like these kind of system logs that um that are starting to happen so that, yeah, so that you can figure out things that happen from afar or things that are, that happen because somebody walked in the room at an unexpected time. Um, those things, those things are, are, are coming and are, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to figure out how to design them. Right. And I, I know that um just, As an example, uh, the elevator at the office where I work every day, super unpredictable. Um, It breaks in new and fascinating ways every day. And I always used to think before experiencing this elevator, like you would press a button uh, to summon the elevator to go up or down, and then somebody else would come along and press the button again because there's uh, not enough feedback from the elevator for the both of us. Um, and this elevator would, would, uh, essentially unpress the button and then just continue doing whatever, whatever it wanted, which is extremely frustrating because you have no idea. Right. Why? Yeah. Why why it did that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you also go into the idea of like kind of on the flip side of that feedback of, uh, feed forward or letting the user know what will happen ahead of time. So I'm interested in, like, what are some techniques for feed forward? Obviously, there are things like labels and icons and just obvious physical relationships between things. But what are what are some other ways to kind of implement that? Yeah, to, to indicate feed. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, labels and diagrams and I mean, tooltips are really the the classic the classic version of them, you know, as you roll over, it's like, oh, you do this thing. I mean, it's also making sure that that things are clear about um, instructions. So buttons that don't say things like submit or, you know, that, that have a much clearer, you know, this is this is what's going to happen. You're, or if it does say submit, it's like submit this form or, you know, save and continue versus just, you know, okay. You know, making sure that right. you have some idea 
just what's about to happen before before you do it and especially things that you know if since we've been talking about voice and and gestural stuff things that things that don't have a, a really good undo and where it's very hard to undo them need some um need some confirmation and, and actually it's, it's interesting that i mean if, if you ask alexa for instance hey set an alarm for three for three o'clock she will come back and say like is that in the afternoon or or in the, or early in the morning you know so so things like that that let you know like okay um I'm, I'm confirming what's about to happen so that at three in the morning an alarm doesn't go off when you meant three in the afternoon so those kinds of little tricks uh, are all kind of what what the idea of feed forward is about like letting people know this is something that's going to happen <laughs> and yeah it's 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 been something that's that's you know for for years and, and some of it is just a learning curve like you know the the idea that you could flip a switch and the lights in a room go on that was something that was that was a novelty at one point where you know because it was just there was and it's completely disconnected from it, it it breaks kind of good interaction design and industrial design practice where you put the control right near the thing that's being controlled and now farther and farther we get from that now you you know now you don't even need to be you can be on the other side of the planet and control your thermostat so uh it's a it's a brave new world we're in right <laughs> uh yeah I, I think um i think that's gonna wrap it up for this episode um thank you again for coming on all right uh, it's been a fascinating discussion should definitely uh, continue this conversation sometime. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This was this was fun. Uh, did the dive deep into some of the answers.